Amen, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you all for filling in and doing such a wonderful job with Heather being gone. I didn't tell her that she lost her job. <laughs> okay, then I won't. Andrew, we're safe. Andrew's your husband. Thank y'all so much. Thank y'all so much. Let's pray. Father, what a what an honor it is to serve you and love you and worship you, Father. And Father, I pray now as I begin to take your precious word, Father, that it would be only your voice that you hear, Father, that it only be what you would want to say here, Father, in a way that would help transform each life, Father, to look just a little bit more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, that's what we want. That's what we desire. Father, place your desires in our heart and make we accomplish those things that you've already planned for us. <coughs> Father, thank you for this precious body of believers. Thank you, Father, that they're here. Father, they're here to honor and serve you and no one else. Father, what a precious day it is in the kingdom. For it's a precious day. Your last Sunday we were looking at how suffering and hardships make available an opportunity for us to pray, thus increasing our trust and our faith in God. In James 5.13 it says, Are any of you suffering hardships? I love this part. You should pray. Are any of you happy? Then you should sing praises to the Lord. What is that from? All the way from suffering to singing praises. And by the way, may I add to your church that when you pray through your hardships, God will lead you to a singing and a praising of joyfulness as you go through it. <coughs> See, outside events or sufferings, they transform us in one of two ways we talked about. See, James knew this back in his church and was wanting to circumvent his beautiful congregation from falling into sin. You see, there's two ways that we can follow when we suffer hardships. Number one, we can go to prayer and we can seek guidance from God during these difficult situations. We can form a deeper trust and a deeper faith in God through each event in life. What happens in that process? Guess what? Your heart softens, and God molds and shapes you to be more like Him. And He gives you a hope, a hope of things that will come that you know for sure that are there regardless of what you go through on this earth. You see, God has a place already preserved for you in the kingdom. He has a room for you. And His Son even has a little white stone that no one knows the name of except Him. And when you see that in Revelation, when He sees you, He'll tell you that name. That's how special you are to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The second option that we have is not so good. I remember my granddaughter, she was about three years old. I said, how do you like that? She said, not so good, Poppy. Not so good. She didn't like the way it was going. The second option is not so good. If we're not careful, we'll take charge of our conflicts and we'll use ungodly ways and ungodly advice, transforming us into looking more like the world rather than our Father, Son, Jesus Christ. In that process, your hearts are hardened and we become bitter. And many times we become trying to control the situation instead of letting God work through it so we can find Him in the process of the difficulties and weave it back into our lives so we can honor and serve Him. For you and I, the choice is clear, Scripture says. We're to avoid option two, where we take our own troubles without consulting with God first. Let me show you what happens when we allow our hearts to turn towards God. Ephesians 4, 14-15. When we allow our hearts to turn towards God, we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown by every wind of new teaching. We won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. You have good discernment when you're in God's Word. You know the truth from a lie. Instead, we'll speak the truth in love. Well, if there's one thing I'd love for y'all to do. You know what? Let me rephrase that. There's one thing I need to do all the time. I want to speak that beautiful truth in love. Sometimes it's a little bit of a disciplinary action. But still, it needs to be presented the truth in love. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. We will be growing in every way more and more like Christ who is the head of this body and this precious church. I am not the head of this church. Jesus Christ is the head of this church. He just chose me and said, I want you to be serving and loving and speaking the truth in love and teach them how to be closer to me, Mike. 
And Mike, you do that by hiding yourself. You do that by letting pride go to the ground. You do that by being humble and loving and speaking the truth in love. You see, we must come to know the differences between the wisdom of God and the foolishness of worldly wisdom. By the way, this is only achieved by careful and diligent study of the Word of God, seeking God's wisdom and praying and appealing to the beautiful mercies of God. We see the Apostle Paul appealing to the mercies of God. We see it in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Y'all know this verse, many of you by memory. By the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that by testing, listen to this, you may discern what the will of God is, and what is good, and what is acceptable, and what is perfect. You see, there's something that God does here in this verse. He transforms. But there's also something that we must do here. We must renew our minds. We must present ourselves to God. We must resist forces that conform us to the world. For transformation to occur, God the Holy Spirit will encourage you. So don't worry, you're not left alone. God the Holy Spirit encourages you. God the Holy Spirit will help you understand the Scriptures as you read them. As you think, that's renewing your mind. As you submit, that's presenting your body as a living sacrifice. And as you act righteously, not being conformed to this world. Oh, my dear souls, do you know how dark it is out there for many people? Do you know that many people don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior? Do you realize that you're a light of hope for them? They may wonder why that your marriages are doing well. They wonder, may wonder why you're getting through difficult situations that would make them collapse to the ground. But they see something different in you. They see something in you that they want to be like. Oh, and I pray that thing that they want to be different is the love of Jesus Christ shining through your life to them. Oh, I pray for that. That one special little child that meets your life. You may not even know if they're watching you. Man, they're watching you. And they're looking for something, a hope. You don't know what's happened in their life. You may run across people going through divorce. They may have lost their spouses. They may have lost a child. It's happened just recently in a family that I know. It disrupts the whole family, but I want to tell you something. When your foundation is Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will recover. Amen. You will recover. You see, these actions, thinking, submitting, and acting righteously enable or allow transformation. And prayer is an absolute necessity in transformation. We need to ask God for help in this process. Please, brothers and sisters, ask God to help you in your deepest, darkest times. He is there. He knows what it's like. He knows what it's like to pass the cup. I don't want this cup, Lord. What do I do? But your will be done, so I will take on the cross, Father, if that's what you want. But if you can take this from me, take it from me. But no, thy will be done, not my will be done. These actions enable us to transform. We need to ask God for help. Why? Let me tell you. Because it's God's process. It's His plan, His process that we are invited to participate in. Look with me at two pieces of Scripture. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. Know that in my heart too, don't you? Oh, you've been saved by grace. For you have been saved, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of your works. Not that anyone will boast. And let's don't forget verse 10 because here's your point. For we are His workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. It's a complete plan. He saved you. He prepared it for you. Now who's going to finish it for us? Look at Philippians 1, verses 6, 9, 10, 11. Here's who completes it for you. And I am certain that God, who began the work within you, will continue His work until it's finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. There's your completer. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding, for I want you to understand what really matters. What really matters, Lord? So that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day Christ returns. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteousness character produced in your life, 
by Jesus Christ. For this will bring you much glory and praise to God. He says, I want you to keep on growing in knowledge and understand. They need to understand what really matters. What really matters, Lord? The righteousness character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. Church, that matters. That matters. That's your beacon. That's your light. That's the light of hope to a world that's lost. That's actually the light of hope to others also. They may be strayed in their ways if they've accepted Christ as their Savior. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Your hope in their life may have them rekindle that fire and love for Christ and they can return back to that walk in obedience that they lost and walked away from. You see, this process happens over time with a steady diet of listening to God's Word. It's a love story. And a steady diet of prayer. God's people can experience this transformative power. His love story is our word. It's the Bible. It's a walk with Christ. It shows you how to love and live through the most difficult times in your life. I'm going to promise you one thing. If you haven't had it yet, and I don't know anybody in this church that hasn't had it yet, you are going to have a difficult time. You're going to wonder what's happened. And for a short second, you're going to wonder where God is because this shouldn't happen then you're going to realize you live in a fallen world and that's why Christ came into this world to save us of our sins and He will take us out of this world. He came back into the dungeon we built. We built this place on our sin. He came back and unlocked sin's door and destroyed it by His death and resurrection on the cross. Brothers and sisters, God loves you. He loves you deeply loves you deeply. Today we're going to see that God has another practice that we need to observe. This one's not so fun many times. We find it in verse 16 of James chapter 5. It's dealing with the sin in our life allows our Heavenly Father to transform us through confessing of our sins, allowing shame and guilt to disappear and our relationships to be restored. See, the Apostle John talks to us about this confessing of sin. He says in 1 John 1, 5-10, I love this. This is John, the apostle who walked with Christ. He says, This is the message we have heard from Jesus, and now we declare to you, God is light, and there is no darkness in Him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but we're living in a spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us all sin. Wow. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that His Word has no place in our hearts. I am a sinner saved by grace and I have a place for God in my heart because Jesus Christ carved it out with His righteousness on the cross and above the grave. That's a little spot He created for me here that's holy. I just take that one holy spot. The rest may be horrible, but I'm claiming that spot right there. Yeah. That's my Lord. That's my Savior. It's right there in that heart. Lord, just keep on working on that heart. Keep on taking that heart. Put it on that wheel. Break it. Put a little grace glue on it. Reshape it to look more like my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, we're continually on that wheel. Some might say, well, Pastor Mike, how in the world can confessing sin help me be more like Christ? That's a great question. Glad you asked it. <laughs> Let's read John, James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other. Why? So that you may be healed. Now look at the end of this verse. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. See, confessions allows us to be restored in our walk as a righteous person. And that's outside of being saved. Once saved, always saved. We have a walk with Christ. You see, don't confuse your position justified by the righteousness of Christ with what He did for you on the cross. Just don't confuse that with our sanctification, our walk with Christ, our practice with Christ. Our practice, so to speak, with Christ is one of obedience. We fall, we confess, we get up. Someone asked me a while back, how do I know I'm getting closer to Christ? 
and being more obedient to Him. I said, your confession time starts to get farther and farther apart, I think. Every once in a while you may fall down. It's not like me when I was young, falling down every time I turned around. You see, I refer to this process as intentionally righteous by Christ's sacrifice and externally righteous by obedience to Christ in your walk. <coughs> see, James 5.16 helps us understand this whole Christ passage regarding confession to one another and being healed. Here's what James is saying. James is saying, in effect, there are those now in this assembly who are sick because of sin right now. Hang with me. The elders are to come upon being called and they are to pray and wait upon God to bring about restoration to those that are sick because of sin. I'm going to explain that. However, James is also saying now there are some of you here right now who need to take care of this matter before this sickness sets in. So in his church, there were, there, there were those who at the present time were sick because of this sin. We're going to talk about that. Then there was also some there that needed to confess with one another and get this right before they fell into that sickness also. So how do we get well and keep from getting sick? Verse 16 says, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another before the sickness of sin sets in. Now I'm going to refer to a similar situation in Scripture. Which sin in the church led to God's discipline of sickness, weakness, and even death. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 31, Paul writes regarding those that were what? Abusing the Lord's Supper. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord is in an unworthy manner, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. For this reason, here's the result. Many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. It's time for death. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. You see, the reality of sin that leads to a sickness and death can be resolved by confessing your sins to one another. I want to remind you of the context here. In the previous verse we read, Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. If you're happy, sing praises. Are any of you sick? Call for the elders of the church to come pray. Anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will heal you. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Let me remind you that this is one of the most difficult, the most misunderstood, disputed passages and portion of Scripture, James. At first glance, it appears that they're teaching that sick believers can be expect physical healing through the prayers of the elders. Now, mind you, prayer, effective prayer, does heal, but only because God does. Okay, but this verse is referring to something else. Such an interpretation of thinking this is physical sickness is out of harmony with the context of the scripture. Now, the persons of James' pastoral care are identified first as the weary, suffering believers. James says, are any of you suffering? You should pray. See, the word suffering is from keopathed. The verb form of the noun translated suffering, and the word refers to enduring evil treatment by people, not a physical illness. The people that were in James' congregation scattered abroad, man, they were getting treated horribly. They were under persecution. The early church, they'd come over from the temple, so to speak, in the sanctuary, and they'd come into the other church, which was now a Christian church. They were not allowed now to be part of families. They were excluded from all activities that they had once so been accustomed to. Many kicked out of families all because they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. And that's what James is saying here. The word also refers to enduring evil treatment by people. And again, not physical illness. Let me show you 2 Timothy 2, 9 and 2 Timothy 4, 5 to give an example of what I'm talking about. Here's Paul talking to Timothy. He says, and because I preach this good news, what does Paul say? I am chaopathic. I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal, but the word of God cannot be changed. 2 Timothy 4, 5. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. So there's a spiritual suffering that's going on. See, James addresses not those suffering from physical diseases, but those being persecuted, abused, and treated wickedly. That's what's going on. And notice the word healed in verse 15. The purpose of the mutual prayer that James called for and that believers may be healed is I healed does not necessarily refer to a physical healing either. 
The writer of Hebrews shows this metaphorically to speak of a spiritual restoration. Peter used it to describe healing from sin. Christ purchased for believers on the cross. Look with me at 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25 as an example. And he himself bore our sins, and Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Here we are. For by his wounds you were healed. Spiritual healing. You were saved. By his wounds you were healed. Because he gave his life for your sin, he destroyed the effect of sin in your life. And by his wounds, you were spiritually made alive when you accepted Christ as your Savior. Yeah. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you return to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. What a beautiful phrase. And the guardian of your soul. Wow. James used to refer to God's forgiveness, making repentant believers spiritually whole again. Our question might be, well, what kind of confession is this, Pastor Mike, that we're talking about? Because we want to be alive. We don't want to get sick. James isn't talking about our original confession of faith for salvation. That's taken care of. He's talking to brothers and sisters in the church. He's not referring to confession or offenses before God either. That's taken care of. He's not urging confession to a priest in a dark, dark, small little booth either. And he certainly doesn't advocate indiscriminately dumping into your sins and shame in front of everybody in the congregation. This context of James' message suggests making amends with those whom you have wronged and forgiving those that have wronged you. Wow. What does that do? Can I remind me that God is not a God of division. He's a God of unity. He unites our hearts together. This precious little church is how to unite a heart together. I was talking to one person who came in for the first time, and she said, this is a sweet little place. Amen. I said, yes, it is. And it's only sweet because of the beautiful love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Only He can take these crazy, wicked hearts and make them look like the Son of Jesus Christ. This is His doing. Good lands. I was going to say my mother was alive, but she is 94 years old. Good lands. Which, good, how long do you... These Turners live way too long. <laughs> she could tell you some things about Mike Turner that give you the right for you to say, don't be up here. But then she could also give you the other side of it that says, yes, He does, because He loves His Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Talk about a mom that's proud of you. Wow. I don't have to be proud. My mama's got enough pride in me. I can just use hers. Don't you love your mama? Yeah. Wow. And I know there may be some of you out there that have difficult times with your mama, and I'm sorry. But there's a special way in your heart. If that's still affecting you, holler at me. Let me help you get processed through that because I want to show you how to love your mama like God does. Or any parent that's there, let me help you with that. Don't, don't let that occupy your mind and take away from you walking and serving Christ. Don't you let those things do that. Some were hearing that were there, that they were sick deep inside, and their, 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 their soul was plagued by gnawing bitterness or guilt. That was what was going on. Some of them were hearing the message that, John, that James was giving them. Their souls were sick deep inside, and their souls were plagued by gnawing bitterness of guilt. They were angry, they were upset with what was happening. There were some that were in the process of fixing to fall into it, and there were some that already fell into it. The solution is the same. You see, if you allow these thoughts to fester without clearing them out through confession and prayer, they will absolutely consume you. They will tear you apart. Broken relationships result in being hurt. If you don't take care of that hurt in a way, and there's a way to do that, and I'm not telling you to go back to someone that's horrifically, horrifically abused you, don't you dare enter into that. You come to me and let me show you how to work through that process because I want you safe. But there's a way to release that to your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and He'll take care of that and He'll do a working in their life and I'll show you how to pray for that working in the life because if that one person gets saved or gets better, they won't harm anybody else. Amen? That'd be a great thing to happen, wouldn't it? You see, if you allow these thoughts to fester without clearing them out through confession and prayer, they'll consume you. There's something about witnessing God's beautiful grace in a little group when someone states something they think is way beyond 
forgiveness. And someone next to him says, Brother, I love you and we'll pray for you and God's grace will cover that. There's something about that process in that group that helps restore those precious souls. You know, God's in the restoration business and y'all restore cars. He's restoring this old car, let me tell you. Don't you like it? <laughs> These things eventually will work their way out in the form of unhealthy habits. It'll lead to a chronic depression. It'll lead to unmanageable stress. There's underlying anger and even a physical illness can result from all of these things that fester if they're not cleared out with your brothers and sisters walking through it in the beautiful grace that God has given us. Let me tell you though, it doesn't have to be that way. You see, when believers in Christ confess their sins to those they've wronged, their guilt will be healed. It's healed. When they pray for those who have harmed them, their bitterness will be cured. And guess what? When you have released the burdens of guilt and bitterness through confession and prayer, the garbage that is contaminated and diseased, your inner life will absolutely be cleared away. It's like taking the trash out on Mondays and Thursdays. I don't know what your days are. If you can think about that, just go to your trash barrel, throw all that stuff in the barrel and take it out in front of your street and let somebody haul it off. Get rid of it. It doesn't serve you well. You see, the condition of righteous before God and others results in your ability to pray more effectively. We want effective prayer. The effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What's righteous? Obedience and a walk to Christ. That's what effective is. Pray, 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 pray. That condition of righteous before God and others will result in your ability to pray more effectively. James affirms that the effect of prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. In closing, prayer is powerful when combined with spiritual faithfulness, that is, the exclusive pursuit of obedience of God's Word and His ways. It's a process, church. It takes time. But it takes time doing the right things. It takes time studying God's Word as it applies in your life not in someone else's life. Use God's Word to work through your life. Use His Word as an affirmative process to help you look more like Him. What's the end result? It's what the Bible calls a righteous person. Righteous on the inside because of Jesus Christ and what He's done for me. Righteous in my walk on the outside by following my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for others to see. We have a witness before God and we have a witness before it's that simple. Let your inside show what your outside looks like. Let your insides look, you know what I mean. Let your inside look like. That one, that, one, that one went around the brain and out the wrong ear. But the more consistent our faithfulness in times of peace, the better the chance it will translate into the kind of faith that we'll need in times of trials and in times of hardships. I don't care about how old you are. You're still going to have some troubles. I, I do care, but I don't know what I mean by that. But let me tell you, the one that is faithful never ages. He's eternal, but he'll be there with you, for you, by you. And all you got to do is call him. He's ready and he's there. The last part of James says, My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders away from the truth that brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back will save the person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. What a beautiful process that our loving Lord and Savior has invited us into. Help a wavered brother be brought back to life. Many people believe this scripture says it's someone that's really not saved. Uh, that's fine. Bring him back to Jesus. That's okay. Just do it. Let it happen. Do it. James is talking to you and I. He's saying, don't you dare let your bitterness, don't let your anger, don't let your wrath, don't let that oil up inside of you and keep you from effectively praying from a pure heart. One last thing, men. If you got something going on with your wives, clear it up. Because if you ever read 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, get it right or your prayers won't be heard. Men, you want your prayers heard? I do. 
Mind if I've done anything? I'm sorry, so we're clean, right? <laughs> Doesn't work yet. We'll talk. <laughs> we'll, yes, we will. Anyway, let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to be in your presence. What a, what a, what a wonderful, what a wonderful understanding it is that we're always in your presence. And Father, you're always here with us. You won't ever leave us nor forsake us. Father, I thank you for the gifts and the offerings that you bring to this precious body of believers. Father, I thank you for the people that are here. Father, what a blessing it is. And Father, I pray that those that have just come for the first time, I pray they feel a love, Father, that's here. And Father, that it's your love and your love alone. Father, may we work together under your guidance, Father, in order to truly praise and worship you. And Father, may you look down and say, a job well done in the praise category for you. Father, we love you and thank you. Thank you for this beautiful worship team. Thank you for all the missions of this church, the ministries of this church. Father, they're all yours. We give them to you. Father, we love you and thank you. In your precious name I pray. Amen.